Hello, and welcome to today's WCET webcast. My name is Megan Raymond, and I am the Director of Programs and Membership here at WCET. Today's webinar is Narrowing the Digital Divide, Pragmatic and Student-Centered Approaches. As we go through today, if you have any questions, please enter them into the question box rather than the chat box, so that way we can help manage the questions better. You can access a link to the PowerPoint in the chat box, so feel free to download and follow along. This webinar is being recorded and we'll share the link back out with you as well as a link to the PowerPoint and any resource, resources that were shared today. We tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel if you'd like to participate. You can also ask your questions there and the hashtag is WCET webcast. We would like to thank Vitac for making live captions available today. Again, if you have any questions, go ahead and enter them into the chat box and we'll be sure to monitor that. If we need to interject, we certainly will and we'll ask your question. Otherwise, we'll hold till the Q&A portion of the webinar. I'd like to introduce our wonderful moderator and my friend, Sharon Liu. She's the, Sharon, the Senior Policy Advisor for Higher Education Innovation at the Department of Education in the Office of Educational Technology. So Sharon, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little background about you and then introduce the speakers. Um, thanks, Megan, and thank you all for joining us. Um, this is such an exciting and important topic, so I'm so glad that we have an opportunity to hear um, from so many people who are doing great work in this area. Um, so like Megan said, I'm a senior policy advisor um, in the Office of Educational Technology at the Department of Education. Um, and our mission is actually to increase the effective use of technology. So not any technology, but technology that improves teaching and learning and access and opportunity for students. Um, and a lot of the um, work that we do actually is out, also outside of higher education. So while I focus on higher education workforce um, development, there are others on my team that focus on K-12, early learning, um, as well as um, sort of some cut, cross cutting issues related to digital access um, and digital uh, so um, we have just, um, I wanted to share something really quickly. Um, we have just um, finished a series of six regional home access listening sessions. Um, and we were able to talk with 34 different state leaders in 24 states across the US um, to ask them questions about infrastructure, data, affordability, sustainability, partnerships, training, and policy. Um, and the key purpose of us hosting these listening sessions is actually not unlike this webinar. Um, we wanted to identify some specific issues um, and actions that states are taking to address some of these um, questions related to digital access and the sort of issues related to how students, um, especially those who are not located in um, well-to-do areas with good connectivity, can have equal opportunity to um, access education. So what we're doing is we're taking some of that feedback as well as um, information that we're gathering um, through um, sessions like this and from you know other listening sessions to develop what we are going to call a home access playbook. Um, this is related to work that we are doing in collaboration with our um, colleagues at the FCC and the NTIA. So I welcome you. I think there's a slide at the end with all of our contact information to um, contact me if you have um, inf information that is useful um, or to contact any of our panelists who are actually in the trenches doing the work. Um, so would you go to the next slide, please? So I have the pleasure of um, introducing our speakers. And um, we have four people who are involved in different aspects of addressing this issue. And I think we'll have some really um, robust conversations. So Mordecai Brownlee, who is the Vice, Pres Vice President for Student Success at St. Philip's College. Jarrett Cummings, who works on government relations and policy for EDUCAUSE. Robin DeRosa, who is the Director of Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative at Plymouth State University as well as Nate Sutherland, the Provost and Chief Academic Officer at Coco Nino Community College. So the format will be that we will just, we have a couple of directed questions um, for each of the speakers, as well as some general group discussion questions. Um, we hope that you will put your questions into the Q&A because we have reserved a significant portion of this hour to, to interacting with all of you all. And then we'll close it, I think, with some encouraging words of actions and next steps. So, um, with that, um, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so 
Um, with that, let's go to Jarrett Cummings from EduCause. And Jarrett, would you please introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what EduCause is working on to help us sort of set the stage for what the national landscape on this is. Um, and in particular, um, we'd love to hear a little bit more about the quick polls that you all have been doing and what you've been hearing from your members nationally about what some of the key struggles are, what some of the strategies are and any recommendations that you have. There we go, gotta remember to turn the mute off. So thank you, Sharon, appreciate it. Um, as a senior advisor for policy and government relations with EDUCAUSE, um, you know, we try to cover, uh, you know, all issues that impact IT and higher education and clearly uh, student access to uh, broadband is, is a critical concern for institutions. Um, when we talk about uh, the quick polls that we launched as an association, uh, we really began that uh, at the start of the pandemic to uh, help members get a quick sense for what they and their peers are facing uh, in, in relation to major issues. And one of the first ones uh, that uh, our research group launched was around the issue of the help that students need in transitioning uh, to online learning and to uh, you know, a fully virtual environment during the pandemic. And so uh, while the quick polls you know, are, are not um, you know, uh, uh, statistically representative samples, they're, they're really um, members responding in a very short period of time to a topic and sharing their thoughts, um, we do get uh, some, some pretty significant participation. And so about 270 institutions uh, participated in uh, this initial poll in April on the issue of student needs. And of that group, uh, uh, roughly a third uh, found that their students had significant difficulty with internet access um, as a result of the pandemic, with another quarter uh, indicating that they had at least some difficulty, that their students had some difficulty with internet access. Um, at the same time, about a quarter indicated uh, that they were ha that students were having difficulty with uh, device access, significant difficulty with device access now that they were fully reliant on their own resources. And from that, another um, roughly 30% were having some access. So it just gives you some sense from the perspective of higher education, IT leaders and professionals, which form the, the core of the EDUCAUSE community, what they're seeing and experiencing uh, on behalf of their students as a result of that uh, as a result of that transition. Um, so are we moving straight into um, the slides at this juncture? Okay. Um, go for it. I think we are on your second slide or your first slide. You let us know which slide you want to be on. Gotcha. No, for, first slide, please. So the so the discussion of the, the quick poll impact, I think, uh, helps us to uh, kind of start to set the stage for where we are as a community now and uh, where we were before the pandemic. Uh, so even before um, those issues started to surface, um, we know, and I know my uh, colleagues on the panel will speak to, uh, the many institutions that you know, felt the digital divide among their student bodies very viscerally. It was a really uh, constant living issue for them. But for, for most institutions, their institutional facilities and networks uh, somewhat masked the impact of the digital divide uh, among the higher education student population. However, there were already indications that there were significant issues lurking, before, lurking below the surface. Um, so for example, a 2018 research study uh, of about 750 students, again, a non-representative sample, but just a, a, a research effort to start to provide some indications where problems may exist, uh, found that 20% of the students that were surveyed were already having difficulty maintaining access to technology. Um, and that was when institutional facilities and networks were generally available to them. Likewise, Microsoft found in 2019 uh, through their own uh, research uh, around the use of their uh, platforms and products that nearly 163 million Americans were not accessing the internet at broadband speeds. So even though within higher education, our ability to serve our students through our institutions and our institutional networks uh, 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 put a Band-Aid over that problem that many students had with device and broadband access, 
the pandemic has ripped that bandaid ripped that bandaid off. And you know we can see that in both the anecdotal stories uh, that have emerged as well as in the data um, that the lack of access to campus labs and networks um, that uh, students returning to unserved or underserved areas where they don't have good access in the home or don't have good device access in the home and now other forms of uh, publicly available access that they might have availed themselves of previously, such as through their public library or Starbucks, or maybe, you know, their mobile device where previously other forms of access uh, didn't make uh, a data cap a significant problem. Now all of that has come to the fore. And through the same poll I mentioned, we see that institutions really made a significant effort right at the start of the pandemic to respond. Um, so 81% of uh, the respondents to our quick poll in April said that their institutions were loaning devices, loaning computers and laptops um, to their students to try to help them address those issues. Nearly 50% were actively mailing out uh, Wi-Fi hotspots to help their students deal with the lack of broadband access in their area. And from my own conversations with members, I've found that this is a persistent issue, even though we have not um, conducted a, a, a follow-up poll on that issue recently. I know from my personal discussions with different members that this is a continues to be a significant concern for IT leaders and professionals in higher education. The needs of their students for device and broadband access simply have not gone away. Uh, next slide, please. And so, you know, with that, from a, uh, a federal policy standpoint, um, we're left in a situation where we have to look for options now and hope for real solutions in the long run. Um, with that in mind, EDUCAUSE joined with 29 other associations to send comments to Congress earlier this year, trying to address the student broadband and device access problem, along with some longer term discussion of broadband infrastructure needs within higher education. Uh, a critical component of, of the comments that we submitted was to stress the importance of passing the Supporting Connectivity for Higher Education Students in Need Act, which would create a $1 billion fund to provide institutions with grants so that they in turn can more easily and consistently provide devices and broadband service to their students in need. Um, Likewise, in this context of uh, uh, significant broadband access problems uh, for the education sector in general, um, we know that um, K through 12 public libraries and public interest groups have pushed for uh, using the FCC's Universal Service Fund programs, E-Rate and Lifeline, to try to address connectivity issues for K through 12 students as well as the public in general. And so in that context, we, we stress the importance of making Pell Grant eligibility uh, a criterion for eligibility for a lifeline subsidy, which is a program that gives um, subsidies uh, to households for uh, telecommunication services. Uh, likewise, we asked that if the E-rate program were going to be used to extend uh, internet access out into communities, that um, the E-rate the e um, institutions work with higher education institutions to make sure that our students who are dispersed into, in many cases, unserved or underserved communities know about the availability of Wi-Fi or um, broadband access provided through those vehicles. Um, so those are some of the, the short-term policy solutions that we were calling for. In the long run, though, the only way to really bridge the digital divide consistently across the country is going to be to fund uh, the final build out of broadband nationally via a national infrastructure plan. Um, and so we, we know that there are both um, in rural areas as well as in urban areas that there are, for lack of a better way of putting it, um, broadband deserts that these are places where people simply cannot get effective broadband access, even if they have device access, which is often a significant problem. And that given the 
virtualization of our economy and, the, and our society as a result of the pandemic, that this is something that's going to have to be addressed to ensure that those members of our community, those members of our society can really be part of the nation as a whole. Um, from that perspective, we advocated in our comments to Congress that research and education networks such as NC Ren in North Carolina or the Merit Network in Michigan, there are you know, myriad of them throughout the United States, um, they can be an important vehicle for helping to extend um, true broadband access into underserved and unserved areas if they are funded as part of this infrastructure solution. And so that's something we're looking for Congress to address in the long run as well. However, until we see that broadband infrastructure plan finally emerge, which I'm hopeful we'll see um, next year in the context of a broader national infrastructure plan, our institutions have to look for how they can help their students overcome these challenges in the, you know, in the near term, in the real world. And so that's what um, my new friends and, and fellow panelists are uh, prepared to speak to. Thanks, Jarrett. Um, and I think there was a question about the stipulations for the Higher Education Students in Need Act. So I dropped a link into the Q&A with the uh, letter of support that you and the 29 other organizations have written just so for everyone's information. Um, so our next panelist is Mordecai Brownlee. And I, Mordecai comes from a school that is um, very interesting and I think gets to exactly what you were um, just talking about, Jarrett. Um, so we all know that COVID has had a disproportionate impact on um, students, um, populations that are minorities, underserved, vulnerable, vulnerable populations. And to your point, Jarrett, like a lot of this is just pulling off the band-aid so we can all see what's underneath now. Um, but definitely um, uh, turning it over to Mordecai, please let us know um, a little bit more about you and your institution and the unique needs that your students face and what some of the, your thoughts and strategies have been so far. Absolutely, Sharon, and thank you to uh, WCET for the opportunity to, uh, to be with you all on today, and thank you, Jared, for really framing out this conversation. So Mordecai Brownlee, I serve as Vice President for Student Success at St. Phillips College. I would like to say the St. Phillips College. We're 122 years old, uh, and we were founded 1898 as a uh, trade school for uh, recently emancipated uh, female slaves to teach them a trade, and we have now grown. Uh, to have uh, two campuses and uh, three campuses on our joint base, uh, San Antonio joint base military uh, locations and uh, 13,500 students, uh, about 30% of our portfolio is uh, career and technical education. And uh, we really focus on really addressing the poverty uh, aspect of San Antonio. A lot of people may not know uh, when visiting San Antonio, they see the river walk and they think about the San Antonio Spurs and maybe even SeaWorld. Uh, but for those that are not aware, San Antonio is the uh, most impoverished uh, metropolitan uh, city in the nation. Uh, we about three years ago surpassed Detroit on the poverty scale. So as we talk about really the digital divide in a metropolitan city, San Antonio is the poster child uh, in, that, in that regard. And so uh, too often, I think, is uh, just through assumption as educators, when we think about a lack of broadband uh, activity or access, we maybe think rural. I saw someone in the comment, Ian August even referenced uh, uh, tribal colleges, absolutely, right? And so this whole thought about being in a metropolitan city and then now hearing, well, there's an issue there with access, absolutely. So part of the discussion on today, we'll just kind of go into the next slide, I'll walk right into it. So as we talk about closing the digital divide, uh, there's some, some, some charges that, that I would say that our institutions need to really adapt to and accept and realize that the students that we serve uh, to really get to know and understand those students and to understand what their challenges are and the means in which how we can serve them and continue them on their academic pathways. Uh, and so part of the reality that has come now with COVID, not only are we de dealing with economic challenges, but we're dealing with access challenges and students who were in our case, you know, taking the bus maybe you know an hour, hour and a half to access their campus location. Uh, St. Phillips College is part of one of five colleges that make up the Alamo Colleges, and so the reality is these students then had a face-to-face -face means in order to pursue their their academic pathway towards a career pathway, and we understand that credential is their gateway towards uh, the elimination of poverty. Um, and so, as we talk about social and economic mobility now. The, the, the challenge has become that much 
much more challenging because as we look at you know, meeting the CDC standards, uh, looking at ensuring the health and safety and wellness of our students, faculty, and staff, now online instruction through synchronous, asynchronous has become the primary uh, focus for us in terms of our delivery of instruction. Now still with our career and technical education courses, we have had to reduce the amount of students that can make their way inside of the lab just to ensure that we're meeting the Metro Health standards and the CDC standards. So again, just framing out for you what our challenges are and what we uh, have before us at St. Phillips College. But again, we have done a lot to address that. And I'll kind of walk through that really, really quickly. So first thing, um, I have the pleasure of, and I'm still on that first slide, I have the pleasure of serving as a uh, columnist for EdSurge. And so what you see here is a link to uh, one of the articles that I uh, wrote in uh, July that talked about here's how colleges should help close the digital divide in the COVID era. And it offered uh, some additional information in terms of understanding what the digital divide is, which the term is used to describe the gap between uh, present in society, between those who have access to internet and technology and those who don't. Um, and and uh, then beginning to talk about some of the things as educators that we can look at doing initiatives, um, uh, actions that we can take to really close that digital divide for our student body. Uh, COVID-19 has exacerbated some of the societal issues. Um, I think about what's even happening in the San Antonio community. Uh, Pre-COVID, our, our commencement student speaker, a uh, part of his testimony, and just amazing story, uh, homeless, uh, uh, couch surfing. There were nights that he spent out on park benches and used his cell phone and would, would use his cell phone to complete homework assignments, right? So these are the students that are in our schools that are pursuing an education and pursuing to, to, to impact their lives in a positive means. And so again, what can we do as an institution to help close that gap and create resources and opportunities for their, those students um, that are having such hardship? It is imperative as institutions develop intentional strategies to ensure that students from low socioeconomic backgrounds, students of color, students with disability, active military and veterans can make progress on their academic pathway towards economic and social mobility. You know, as we talk about students of color, that's, I think, a, a large part of the conversation nationally, not just suburban and rural, uh, but understanding that, well, number one, when it comes to poverty, it, it, it has no race. Uh, uh, you know, poverty is a poverty, it's a disease in itself. And so we have an opportunity, again, at our colleges and universities uh, to be sure that we do our part to understand the students that we're serving and create those opportunities to close that gap. You heard Jared talk about uh, the distribution of hotspots, uh, certain laptops. You know, I was talking to one school, they talked about their laptop distribution. I said, that's great, but what about hotspots, right? The assumption thereof that they can still have access to connectivity. And so what are we doing to close that gap? And also not doing that on the backs of students. Right now, students are having to make so many sacrifices to choose our institution to continue their academic pathways. The last thing we need to do is the back end add additional fees to their tuition and fees uh, uh, as, a, as a form of creating resource for them. So what can we do to alleviate the financial burdens for these students and still close the digital divide? As we talk about just uh, some of the broadband access, I was looking at Pew Research uh, uh, recently, and so their last snapshot was back in February 2019. 79% uh, of whites had access to broadband, 66% of blacks, 61% of Hispanics. Uh, in terms of adoption, it talked about 79% in suburban areas, 63% in rural areas. And so depending upon, now again, back to uh, Mr. August's uh, comment about even tribal colleges, uh, while that, that snapshot, the rural um, uh, was the only snapshot that was captured there, but still tribal colleges, absolutely a great point to make there. So again, what can we do with our local uh, state legislation? What can we do with our local communities to create opportunities for infrastructure expansion, and certainly what are we doing at our colleges and universities to do that work as well. Now is the time for institutions to innovate their approaches to access and engagement and responsiveness. It's certainly, uh, next slide please, certainly our charge and what we should be doing to assist students along their pathways. So here, here are just some, some takeaways I would say for those that have joined us on today. And again, thank you for that, uh, joining us uh, part of this discussion. Know your students, know your students. There should be absolutely no assumptions uh, that should be made by an institution to feel as though they have a sense without looking at data and making sure that the data that they are collecting is relevant uh, to truly the voice of their students. So having a sense, yes, we can look at some of the more high-end aspects of, of uh, some of these data pools, looking at financial aid, looking at who is Pell eligible, maybe looking at some of the zip codes in which our students 
funneling in from, and then we can base that and then do some regression analysis in terms of what is the economic standings of those zip codes that our students are coming from, but even more creating opportunities to actually hear the voice of our students. So be sure institutions that we're doing our job of that. Know uh, the voice of your students, create opportunities to receive student feedback. So more than ever, especially in COVID-19, we need to have some, some opportunities on a regular basis, maybe every other week, maybe it's every month that we're creating some town hall opportunities to really hear the challenges of students. Yes, we can create these initiatives and pat ourselves on the back, but are they actually working? And we may find through our students that yes, it's a great step forward based on the initiative that's being taken. However, there still may be some gaps in our approaches. Uh, and then know the challenges of your students. I talked about that young man who was sleeping on park benches. Again, I can give you a laptop, but where are you going to charge it, right? So, so this, this reality then of what can we do from an advocacy standpoint to, again, address the poverty aspects of things to ensure that they're remaining on their pathway. And you already heard me say this before, make no assumptions. Let's clear the pathway for student success. Credential attainment is the, the uh, gateway. So then really taking a good look, a strong look at what's happening at our institutions with our students and doing what we can from an advocacy standpoint and a resource standpoint. Uh, again, as we are now on laptop, we sh she even, you know, we talked about uh, uh, OER has been a part of the conversation, open educational resources. Again, the more adaptation of that, because the students are now utilizing their laptops and their devices, uh, they don't need to depend on having to look for books now, especially more than ever. Again, another financial burden. What can we do to integrate more OER into this, this uh, lens here? And then career technical education. Really, now is the time more than ever to innovate what we have been doing in career and technical education. And I offered uh, just the article that I uh, wrote and released through EdSearch just last week talking about this, uh, looking at AI integration, artificial intelligence, really looking at what we can do for simulation aspects of things. And again, create more opportunities for our students. But with that even said, times are changing, challenges are hard. What can we do, again, to close the digital divide? And I think it's, it's about resource. It's about knowing your students. It's about creating additional pathways for students and making absolutely no assumptions and really taking a no excuses approach for our institutions and our communities when it comes to the elimination of poverty and student success. Thank you, Sharon. It's my turn to forget to unmute. Um, so thank you, Mordecai. That um, was certainly a lot for us to think about. Um, so um, I think our next um, panelist, um, Robin DeRosa, has a lot of thoughts on um, OER and use of technology. And I guess um, as you introduce yourself, Robin, um, one of the things that I think would be great for us to hear about is um, how you all have thought about the expansion of the uses of different types of technology, some of which are new that are now incorporated that, um, you know, so there is on the one level the access to the technology, but thinking about how you've balanced um, what are some of the emergency needs um, um, with some of the long term planning and the innovation and some of the sustainable change that you're hoping to drive within your campus culture. Sure, thanks. Um, and thanks everybody for being here because it's not an easy time to be anywhere, even virtually. Um, and I want to especially now, uh, acknowledge the challenges not only with COVID, um, but the stresses that so many of us are facing um, due to the ongoing uh, sort of racism and, and uh, the stresses of trying to advocate nationally through the BLM movements and also of course now the fires um, out west. I just think about folks out there, you know, struggling just to breathe clean air, you know, inside from COVID and outside from the fires. But what all of that suggests to me is that if you're if you're thinking about this moment as a moment to respond to COVID, um, I think uh, we're doing a disservice to the kinds of impact that we could be having because, you know, when I talk to my students who are most challenged, a lot of what they tell me now during COVID, yes, they are more challenged than they were before, but they're also like, thanks for finally noticing. Um, the fact is that human challenges at um, local, national, and global scales are ongoing and they're going to continue to be ongoing. So I think um, anything we do to respond to COVID, we want to think in terms of the long plan of how when we increase the flexibility of our educational structures, we will be um, helping people, whether they are personally struggling with um, a chronic illness in their own life, 
or caregiving issues um, or longer systemic things like poverty and racism or disasters like COVID or the fires. So what we've been doing at Plymouth State, and I direct the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative, which is um, pretty much a teaching and learning center. I come at things um, a little bit more from a faculty perspective than from an administrative perspective. Um, so I just wanted to frame a few questions that have been part of our broader sort of crisis planning that we've been doing in faculty development. So if we head into the first slide, I can take a look at some of those. Here we go. Um, the first thing I think that a lot of faculty in particular noticed um, is that when disaster hits, people need fast solutions. And um, there were two places that we really saw people rise up with um, what were sometimes called frictionless solutions, easy solutions. And I think when anyone promises you an easy solution to a global pandemic, you might want to look skeptically at them. But of course, you're desperate, right? You're desperate for how you're going to serve your students in a week when suddenly your whole curriculum has been turned upside down. So the two places we saw frictionless solutions develop um, no offense to anybody, but some of that came out of our IT departments, right, where people said, don't worry, um, we have outfitted 100% of our classrooms with little cameras in the wall, <laughs> go for it, you know, and um, if you just looked at any faculty, you just saw the look of horror on their face when you told them that their uh, all of their problems were solved because now there were like two cameras, right. Um, obviously, that didn't deal with the fact I teach at a rural public four-year university um, where, of course, not only do lots of my students not have um, reliable devices or broadband, but some of our faculty don't have it either. Um, they live in rural areas where, um, especially our contingent faculty, counted on campus, you know, to keep them connected. So the Zoom rooms were helpful, but uh, just a step. The other place that we see frictionless solutions all, um, comes from the ed tech industry where we saw immediate promises. You can have free access to this platform for the rest of COVID um, with the idea here, in my opinion, that you're going to develop a kind of dependence on this platform and then you'll purchase it afterwards when everybody's gotten used to it. The problem is that the, the, the plans we make in crisis becomes the, pla the plans we live with after crisis. Um, so my first suggestion is to slow down and talk with teachers and with students about their needs before you talk with IT or the ed tech industry, or have your IT people local in your institution talk with your faculty and students. Um, and the part of what we developed at Plymouth State, I'm going to show you, came out of um, basically discussions with, with faculty and students. If we are going to develop some kind of response to COVID, which we may also be able to use down the line if a student gets a chronic illness um, or if a parent uh, loses a job suddenly and there's turmoil that, um, that creates sort of an economic fallout for a family um, or if there's a, a, an issue like fires, what kind of an, who's gonna pay for, who's gonna sponsor that infrastructure? Um, if we, like for example, um, in my institution, we have been generously gifted many iPads um, from Apple, uh, which are wonderful. We can distribute these to all of the students in need who don't have devices, how, how great. The problem is lots of the software that runs um, and powers these are proprietary and we lock ourselves into longer term um, relationships when we build certain kinds of dependence on different kinds of tools. So the, the, the first thing I would say is um, talk with the people who are on the ground to find out what's ultimately gonna be most um, important. The other thing that we did is we looked at our mission statements, right? These, these generally useless guiding documents um, that are supposed to show how distinctive we all are, but if you look at them, um, so many of them look like each other. But look at the things that we talk about there when we talk about um, access, when we talk about diversity, right? When we talk about any of these things, when you make critical technology decisions during the crisis, can you align every one of those decisions with your mission? Um, and if so, exactly how? Um, and I think those questions need to be answered. Otherwise, what you're gonna do is you might solve the immediate problem um, but the question of where education and particularly where public higher education is going 
I think we could get ourselves um, into a deeper crisis. Um, so my suggestion is that the needs of our learners that are unmet, those are the opportunities that we have for innovation, right? Innovation does not come from technology. It comes from meeting a need that's been previously unmet. Um, so we have to look at need in order to truly innovate, right? Otherwise we're just playing, I think, with, with baubles. Um, and the other piece is to think about alignment, not only alignment with mission, but alignment across levels of your institution. So if your IT department is making decisions in isolation, um, you're not gonna have alignment with faculty. Um, if your curriculum is doing something and it's not aligned with where student life is going, you're gonna have problems. So you wanna align mission with operations, but you also wanna align the different levels of the institution. So I'll give you an example of what this looks like at Plymouth State, if you head to the next slide. Um, we developed a framework, it's uh, openly licensed, which is part of what we deal with in the, in the collab where I work. When we're thinking about public arch architectures, we're thinking about um, not just competing, keeping Plymouth State open so that we can get more enrollments than all the rest of you people. Um, the point is how can we share so that we can create um, sustainable public infrastructure nationally so that all of our students are served, right? That we don't have any gaps. Um, so this framework is openly licensed. It comes also with a four week openly licensed workshop that you can use. And it functions at three levels. Um, the first two, the assignment level and the course level are built for faculty. And the third level, the institution level is built more for um, uh, IT and uh, sort of admin level. Um, and the idea here is to think about taking your mission. So for Plymouth State, we looked at the specific parts of our mission and we thought about what parts of our mission are most important during times of disaster, times of crisis. And we came up with adaptability, connection, and equity. Um, the idea being that obviously, you know, high flex is a really good example of this, right? We have to think about delivery in new ways. So adaptability is core, but we didn't want people to just move online into a sort of competency-based isolated experience where you're just memorizing content. Our pedagogy at Plymouth is very much about project-based learning. It's about um, team-based learning. It's about applied and experiential learning, internships. Well, how are you gonna do that in, in this new environment? And then thirdly about um, equity. So when we looked at things like the digital divide, we tried to think, or, or as Mordecai was talking about OER, we tried to think about all of these things holistically as part of a vision that was absolutely centered um, and mission aligned with the kinds of things that we talked about long before COVID. So if you were to create a framework for your institution, it might look a little bit different but the bottom line is that if you find yourself picking a tool or outfitting a classroom or shipping out an ISP um, you know, address to somebody, these are um, the kinds of measures that I don't think will take us to where we need to go. I'm totally on board with this idea of national infrastructure for broadband, which I think should be um, publicly funded and publicly reg regulated. Um, but institutionally, you can also create that kind of um, larger holistic planning so that when you're talking to your faculty, instead of getting groans about why do I have to do this random high flex thing, you are presenting high flex to them as um, part of a suite of options that help them focus on adaptability, that help them engage their students in the ways that are important. So if you go to the ACE framework, you'll be able to go inside of all of these practices find um, planning tools and exercises um, and examples from faculty who've been using it now. Um, it, it's not a framework that will work for every institution. It's custom built for our own. But the idea is that when you, you wanna think about crisis as an opportunity to augment your mission um, as, as opposed to a, t a time to solve isolated small problems. Um, so I would rather see us fail a little bit more in the immediate because we don't jump to the slicker solutions um, and instead be timely because we know things like the digital divide are not caused by COVID. So as we're solving them, we don't want to solve them for COVID. We want to solve them longer term as part of a, a, a pedagogy and a higher ed approach. 
Um, so anyway, you, you can go check this out and then I can take more questions, but somebody in the chat did have a question about accessibility. Um, so you'll see that UDL baselines there under equity. Um, again, these are all um, the building of the food pantry in my department, the shifting to open educational resources, the renting out of mobile hotspots. These all became part of a larger framework. Um, and if, if you get all of your faculty and all of your students and all of your student life people, that is a hell of a lot more powerful than two guys in IT and a provost, right? You need all your people aligned um, under an idea of what your institution is trying to do. So there you go, and uh, I'll, I'll pass back to Sharon. Oh, thank you, Robin. This was excellent. And thank you also for sharing the resources. Um, so um, right now we'll go to our final panelist, um, Nate Sutherland from Coconino Community College. And I think this will be an interesting balance to hear a little bit about um, the student population that you serve, Nate, and some of the unique challenges and strategies that um, you all have been doing. Um, and I think there are some Q&As that are related to the difference between rural and um, urban um, student strategies. So definitely think that um, this is going to be interesting. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Nate. Thanks, Sharon. Let's go ahead and go to the first slide. One of the privileges of going last is you get to sort of build on what everybody else has already said. So I'm going to start actually by, uh, by building on some of what Dr. Brownlee talked about with knowing your students. Uh, so, so critical in terms of how we design learning experiences for the students. So let me talk for just a minute about uh, our county. Coconino County is, is located in the northern part of Arizona. Our county uh, encompasses everything from central northern Arizona all the way up to the Utah border. It's uh, over 18,000 square miles. Our county, which is the service area for the community college, is larger than eight of the 50 states, including Massachusetts, New Jersey, Vermont. I, so it's a big, big area. The Grand Canyon forms the, the northwestern boundary of our county and the northeastern part of our county, about a third of our county is tribal land, part of the Navajo Nation. Very, very rural, very dispersed population. Our total county population is 145,000. About 75,000 of those live in Flagstaff where our college is headquartered. Uh, but the remainder, there's very few population centers. So you have folks spread out very thinly over a very broad geographic area. Tourism, of course, because of our proximity to the Grand Canyon is the number one industry in our county, uh, which poses some challenges I'm gonna highlight in just a minute. So a little bit about the students that we serve. Uh, our unduplicated headcount this semester is about 3,500. So we're not a large institution, we're kind of smallish. 60% of our students are first generation college students. Uh, about 20% of our students are Native American, about 20% are Latino, about 48% white, and the remainder of, of various uh, mixed ethnicities. Most of our students are in need of remedial math and English instruction. Uh, many of them have never learned online before, whether they're a traditional student who came up through a high school experience recently of course, now a bunch of high school graduates will have had at least a brief introduction to online learning, but many of our students have never done this modality before. As, uh, as Mordecai mentioned, significant levels of housing and food insecurity, that's a very common feature of community colleges, particularly in economically challenged areas. Uh, in describing our county, uh, you have to understand that Many people in our county live in areas with little infrastructure, and I'm not just talking about broadband infrastructure. I'm talking about lack of paved roads, no electricity, no running water, no sewer systems. I mean, we're talking about a total lack of infrastructure for many of the people in our county living in those dispersed areas. Uh, cell service, spotty at best in many parts of our county. In other parts of our county, there is none. So it's, it's uh, when we start talking about access to broadband and a backhaul to the internet, it's a completely different sort of situation than an area where there's infrastructure, you just can't connect to it. So keep that in mind just a little bit. Uh, and then something uh, that was mentioned previously that even those with access to infrastructure and is typically through a cellular device, they're competing for bandwidth with others in their household. Uh, so let me give you a couple of, of uh, specific stories that I think highlight this. 
uh, late last semester, we got a, a message from a student who was trying to uh, participate in finishing out a, a class that had started in person. They were living on the Navajo Nation. Uh, the Navajo Nation, as many of you are aware, uh, was one of the major COVID hotspots. They're doing okay right now, but it was really bad for a while. And as a result, the, the Navajo tribal government had instituted lockdowns. Uh, so people could not travel outside of these very rural communities. So we had a student contact us, uh, was getting up at 10 p.m. and driving 25 miles to a hilltop in order to get enough cell service to download their assignments and to upload the homework that they had already done from their cell phone. Again, they were in some cases bringing their children with them to that hilltop in order to access that cell service so that their children could also exchange their homework with their instructor. Uh, another example. Uh, had a parent come in uh, from another rural area and they were privileged to have broadband internet, quote unquote broadband internet, the best that the local ISP could provide in their home, but they had six people using it. At the same time, all of them trying to participate in Zoom sessions, they had I think two devices total in the household, so they were having to trade time on the devices and they were having to try and ne negotiate the bandwidth concerns. Uh, third example, we've got a community right on the south rim of Grand Canyon called Grand Canyon Village. It's where the Park Service employees uh, live with their families. There's a K-12 school there. We've got students who are participating in college classes there. The south rim of the Grand Canyon gets six million visitors a year. And as soon as everybody gets on Instagram and Snapchat, the single copper line feeding Grand Canyon Village gets completely jammed with network traffic. So our students in Grand Canyon Village are typically doing their classwork, their online classwork between two and four in the morning because that is the only time where there's enough bandwidth to access the resources that we're asking them to, to access. So just th this just illustrates a little bit. Uh, one other quick story, I had another student who, uh, who reported to us that they were able to access cellu cellular data on their cell phone so that they could participate in classes. But because they had no electricity at their home, during the lockdown, they could not recharge their cell phone. So uh, again, th this just sort of illustrates the point that you have to know what it is that your students are facing in order to deliver education to them. What's the implication? You have to design and deliver with the audience in mind. There's times when the low tech solution will result in learning, but the high tech solution might not. So understanding your students and their needs and restrictions leads you to the solution, as Dr. DeRosa mentioned, Rather than the other way around, don't lead with the solution and then try and figure out how to shoehorn it into your students' lives. Uh, another thing really clearly we need to do is to teach our students how to learn remotely. The digital divide is not just an infrastructure and technology divide. It's also a skills, capability, cultural capital. It's a divide of people as well. So we gotta, we gotta teach our folks. I'm gonna gloss over these next things. Uh, Robin already had some good conversation about faculty. Uh, faculty tend to teach how they were taught. There, there's a steep learning curve that we can't ignore. We have to focus on helping our faculty learn how to teach in new ways. And uh, very often, unfortunately, our faculty extrapolate from their own experiences. Well, hey, this isn't a problem for me, so it must not be a problem for my students. And that, that goes everything from infrastructure to learning style. And then again, as was mentioned previously, our faculty live in the same communities that the students do with the same limitations, uh, bandwidth, infrastructure, competing with household members who are also doing school. Uh, in the current pandemic, of course, also supervising their children who are learning online. There's all kinds of things they're facing with. So as Robin mentioned, start with the focus on teaching and learning and then work your way into the tools rather than the other way around. Finally, let me come back quickly to, to something that Jarrett mentioned. Partnerships are critical. One of the reasons why we're, rural infrastructure is so lacking is because it is not economically viable to build out infrastructure for a low client base because you will never recoup the cost of that infrastructure in the service charges that you assess. So many of these communities will never have 
fixed infrastructure. When you start working with tribal utility authorities like the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority, you get some extra layers involved as well because they have some different interests than some of the private uh, utility companies. So what does that mean? We've got to work together. Where a K-12 school has, has E-rate funded infrastructure, the higher ed institutions need to work on that, whether you're a, a two-year, four-year, public, private, we got to work together, government agencies, businesses, we're all serving the same residents with the same challenges. One of the opportunities right now is to partner with our local economic development agencies who are also really interested in this infrastructure uh, challenge because it has real implications for people who are working from home. So in policy conversations, we can partner with the economic development groups and with our other service providing agencies to get that information, to get the infrastructure, to get things out there. And then as was mentioned by one of the folks in the text, uh, traditional fiber and wire infrastructure isn't going to be the answer for a lot of these really uh, diffuse rural areas. Um, there are some other exciting things that are sort of out there. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what Elon Musk does with his uh, satellite network. Uh, some other folks who are trying to address this it's gonna take new answers in new ways. In the meantime, and for the long term, knowing our students, knowing our faculty, and really focusing on what we need to be teaching and what they need to be learning, uh, that's really a lot of the, the need for us to focus on. Back to you, Sharon. Thanks, Nate. Um, I think that all of you brought some really interesting points. Um, and so I know that there were a few questions in um, the Q&A as well as the chat um, that I think we've kind of addressed. And I just want to point to one thing that you said um, was about finding partners. And I just dropped a link into the chat for the NTIA's um, State Broadband Leaders Network. And this is a group that we have worked with as well. Um, but essentially, it's a group of like-minded, um, you know, very wide variety of state leaders, whether it's state libraries or, you know, state higher ed or K to 12 or library um, advocates for broadband access that um, might be interested in partnering with you as well as some private companies as well. So um, that's one really great way of staying in contact with those that are regionally at least located near you. Um, before we get to the question from the audience, something that I thought was interesting that several people mentioned, and we can just go quickly, whoever um, on the panel wants to answer this, but like assuming that I have a magic wand, which I don't, it's a pen, um, I'm gonna wave it around and suddenly everyone's going to have broadband in their homes. Like, are, have we then solved the digital divide and have we solved all of our education problems in the US or is this just one of many things? Um, so I'll kick it over to the panel, waving wand. I'm going to there. Oh, go for it, Nate. Go for it, Nate. Okay, just, just real quickly, what I said, uh, not all people are equally prepared to learn remotely, and not all people benefit equally from learning remotely, not just in terms of personal learning style, but in terms of the subject matter uh, that they're studying. Over to you, Morgan. Brother, you, you, you just hit the nail on the head, right? So uh, nothing more to add there. So it, it doesn't fix it all. Just having access to it uh, just does not fix fix the topic. What can we do, especially when we talk about poverty and addressing poverty, to be sure that we're bringing everyone up to scale? It's equality and equity. What can we do there? And also, I, like, there's scholars like um, Chris Gilliard and Sophia Noble who write about the problems inside of tech and tech platforms, right? Um, the way that algorithms work, digital redlining, um, these are different than just access. These are about, you know, who is controlling um, the interests behind the internet and how things like systemic racism infiltrate those platforms and systems. So I think when we're talking about um, access, we're also talking about a certain kind of digital literacy and inclusion that needs to be centered in how we educate about technology. And if you are choosing tech platforms, but you don't know how the data of your people is being mined. Um, if you don't know what the ethics of the companies are that you are sourcing your platforms from, um, this can be a huge problem. Uh, you know, even if people have access to those platforms, they can end up being really um, impressive tools. 
Well, and, and let's face it, to some extent, uh, there's, there's some assimilation and cultural norming assumed in, in a lot of our online learning platforms and strategies. Uh, I have never seen someone replicate on a, an authentic native learning paradigm in a remote delivery space. Uh, there are other examples as well. We're expecting people to adapt to learning and teaching in a certain kind of way that may or may not be culturally appropriate for them. Yeah, and I would just add that, as was mentioned by others, that um, you know, even in areas where there may be uh, physical in infrastructure available in the community, it may not be equally dispersed or available to all members of the community. We know in many urban areas that there are uh, places where ISPs, um, they may have uh, connections to uh, the sidewalk where landlords have simply not connected, you know, not brought the ISP in to connect service up to the building because there are not enough um, you know, tenants who would make that service viable from the perspective of either the ISP or the landlord. So there are a variety of issues around infrastructure. It's, it, it starts as a, a necessary but not sufficient condition um, for many issues. But then once you've addressed that problem um, through the varied solutions that different environments, different contexts are going to require, you have to take that next step to say, how are we going to make service itself uh, persistently and consistently available. That's great. So I think we're coming on time. So I'm going to turn it um, back over to Megan um, for some closing thoughts. Great. Well, thank you. I learned a lot and thought this conversation was, was just something that gives us all pause and consideration. And I know it's such a difficult and challenging time for all, but I think there was many points raised here that we really need to consider what we're doing in a reactionary mode for the long term and how can we plan and um, do what we're doing best that isn't going to hurt our students or our faculty or those of our colleagues. So here's contact information for all these amazing panelists. And again, the link was shared in the chat box so you can download it and access the email addresses there. I just have a few minutes that I wanna touch on a few things happening at WCET. If you're new to our organization, do visit our website. We have a lot of tremendous resources, links to previous webcasts, and we have a webcast next week, more on OER and copyright. And our upcoming annual meeting, which is virtual, and will be different from most. We're doing two deep dives on two essential seminar topics. One is on equity and access and developing an action plan. And the second is around the notion of quality value of higher education and we're going to spend some time doing some work around uh, brainstorming a new concept of edu the future of edu so as our one of our keynote presenters is going to talk about his name is jamie cassa formerly with google he said i don't know if you all are ready to hear this but he thinks that this pandemic is a real opportunity for us to reset and do what we need to do differently for higher ed so be sure to access that link there for more information and visit our uh, link here for webcasts. All of our previous webcasts are on YouTube and are free and open. And then I just wanna acknowledge our supporting members as well as our sponsors that underwrite much of our programming here at WCET and help us do this good work to bring the message to you. So visit our website, reach out if you have future webcast topics or speakers you'd like us to include. But again, thank you to Sharon. Thank you to my colleague, Tanya Spillavoy for recommending many of these presenters that were here with us today. And it was great to work and hear from Robin, Nate, and Mordecai. So thank you all. Have a wonderful afternoon. And Jarrett, sorry, Jarrett. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. It was a pleasure to learn from you. It was great.